that seems to be working fine. Hello, my name is Patrick, as I mentioned. Um, I'm a backend engineer at Pollen in London, and we do stuff around festival travels and um, events. So if you're interested about that, we can chat later. Uh, but yeah, today I'm going to introduce you to Strawberry, which is a Python library that can be used to create GraphQL APIs. And it's something I've been working on over the past eight months or so. Um, but first, let me introduce what GraphQL is, because I think it's quite a new thing still in Python. <laughs> so over the past 10 or more years, we've seen the web evolving a lot. So instead of having a collection of static documents, we now have a proper application running in the browser. In addition to that, we also have applications running on mobile phones, tablets, and other devices. I then don't necessarily use uh, web technologies. So our previous approach of having web pages rendered on the server wasn't really working, since we have different clients and different requirements. So just to recap, this is something that we used to have uh, previously. So we had the server that was returning a bunch of documents and maybe some static files, uh, like CSS and images. But then we start building application even on the web. So we start building APIs. And this could be an example of um, an application that we have. So we have a bunch of uh, data sources like database, third party service, maybe some caching. And then we have a bunch of clients. So that's really fast. Cool. Uh, we have a bunch of clients that need to talk with this, uh, these services. So we start building an API that's going to co connect them together. And the most popular way of doing this is REST, even today. Um, REST is a simple design architecture where you use HTTP and JSON to extend data between one or more backends and one or more client. So let's see an example. Let's say that we're building a conference website. It's actually a real uh, thing that we, we are building now. Um, Let's say that we are building this in a way to have just a static website that's talking with an API. So we have a bunch of HTML documents that are talking with this uh, API using JavaScript. And in a proper REST uh, endpoints, we have different endpoints. So let's say that we want to fetch the conference information, so the title and the conference description. To do so, we need to call this endpoint uh, slash conference slash Python 11, for example. But then we have a list of events and a list of FAQs, and in a proper REST API, this would mean other two requests. So one to get the events and one to get the FAQs. And REST is a really, really nice design pattern. Um, I really like the idea of using endpoints and HTTP verbs to do operations on them. Um, but it doesn't really, doesn't really scale up well over time, especially if you have APIs that are quite complex with a lot of resources or have different uh, clients that need the API in different ways. <coughs> Some of the problems of REST, especially when you compare it to GraphQL, are overfetching and underfetching. Underfetching refers to not having enough data when using an API, which leads to do more API calls to display all the information that you have on one page. So for example, on our previous uh, page, we need to do three API calls to fetch all the um, information, which it's a waste of bandwidth for our users, but it's also a waste of time on our hand to have having to orchestrate all the information and show the page when everything has been loaded. So just to recap, um, we have an endpoint that returns the conference information, but if we need to show the events, we need to do another API call to get them. <coughs> on the other spectrum, we have overfetching, which means getting more data than we, what we actually need. So let's say we're building a welcome screen that says, welcome to Python Italy. And we're going to use the same endpoint that we had before, which makes sense because it's returning the information that we need. The problem is that it's returning way too much information. It's returning information that we are not really using while we care about just the title, for example. Um, the, the endpoint works great, but we just need a few fields. And it might seem a small problem, uh, especially if you have um, just one client. But if you start having a lot of users or a lot of number of different clients, this is mattering quite a lot. Um, because you're basically wasting uh, data and CPU usage of your users. But also, if you have an endpoint that's quite, uh, like it's doing a lot of API calls, uh, sorry, it's, it's doing a lot of database calls, uh, this might be quite intensive, especially if you're using just one one field from the API. And there are some workarounds. The common one is to use get parameters to change the shape of the response. So for example, in this case, we can say, I want to just the field title and that's going to be returned by the API. Or you can create custom specialized endpoints. For example, for our home page, we can create an endpoint that returns data based on what the client needs. Um, but it looks ugly. It's not really great, I think, especially because you have to document it. And if you start having an API that's quite complex and you have a lot of endpoints, 
if you start adding like different ways of fetching data or if you start um, creating specific endpoints for all the views, it gets really messy quite quickly. And there are some tools that help with documentation, but still, still a pain. I remember doing uh, documentation on a project that was REST API and it was really painful. So we start looking for some alternatives. And one of those alternatives um, is GraphQL, which has been created to solve uh, this issue and others. Um, so instead of having different endpoints, you have only one endpoint where you can send a document and declare the data that you want. And the server is going to return back, back that data to you. So let's see an example. For our previous home page, instead of doing three requests, we only do one, specifying the type of version we want to do. For example, in this case, we want to do a query. We give a name to this operation, and then we specify all the fields that we want to get. So we want to get the conference with ID PyCon 11, and then we'll get title and description, events with a title, and FAQs with question and answer. And so instead of doing multiple requests, we only do one for the data we need. So our previous query, when send it to the server, is going to return something like that. So it's exactly what we ask for, no, nothing more, nothing less. And what's really cool that if I change this request, um, the data is going to change as well. So that makes really, really uh, easy to use this API for different views and different purposes. In addition to that, I think the best feature of GraphQL is that every API has a strongly typed schema. So for our previous API, we can have a schema that looks like this. We have a type query, which is the root of the our API, so it's where all the fields come from. And we have a conference field, which is accepting a code of type ID, and then it's returning a conference. Conference is a title string, description string, FAQs, and events. And then events have a title and image, FAQ as question and answer. And what does this mean for us? It means that documentation is automatically generated because we don't have to describe all the fields that we have. It's everything is already there for us. We can, we can add some um, description to the fields, but we don't really have to spend a lot of time in describing what, all the things we have in this API. And then we can use tools like Graphical, where you can fetch the, all the information about the, this API, but you can also test things, and it's going to autocomplete um, when you start typing, uh, which is really cool. And there are other tools that make use of typing. I think those are really nice to use features, but uh, the best thing is to have, for example, CI, um, CI integration, where you can check um, if the fields that you're asking on the front, they actually exist on, on the API. So I mentioned operations before, and with, GraphQ, with REST, you do HTTP verbs to, to do different things. So get to fetch data, delete to delete, post to create, and so on. In GraphQL, you use um, operation to express different uh, concepts. So you have query to fetch the data. So this is the query we've seen before. We get a conference with that ID, and then we'll return the title. And then this is what the uh, backend is going to return. And we have mutation to change data. So this is a way to do basically all the operations that are not, um, that all the operations that have side effects, like renaming something, uh, deleting something, creating a new user, and so on. And for example, we can have a mutation that's renamed conference. We pass an ID, the new title, and then we get back the title. And this works the same as a query. This is what it will return. So you don't really have to learn different things to do different operations. So how does GraphQL work under the hood? Um, as I mentioned, there is only one endpoint. There's only one endpoint where you send a document using a post request. And then when you send this document, the server is going to do three operations. The first one is parsing the document and convert it to a AST, run some validation. So it checks if the requested field actually exists on the API, if the arguments that you've passed to the, um, to the fields are actually correct, then it's ex executing the query. And execution of the query means that it's calling the resolvers that are attached to the fields. And a resolver is basically a function that's fetching data for a specific field. This might be a bit abstract, but this is what it looks like. So we have a type query with a conference field, and the resolver for conference fields is basically a function that's get exactly the same parameter, as, and then it's returning something. This is nothing more than that. GraphQL, in a way, is kind of like a RPC, where you call functions on a server, which is really cool. And maybe at this point you want to try GraphQL. And to be fair, I'm quite happy that things have changed recently in 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 Python because we until a year ago used to have only one one library which is Graphene, but now we are buffered. So there is Strawberry uh, and then Ariadne and Artiflet, 
uh, which are quite new as well. And it's really good to see that the ecosystem is, is improving. Oh, people taking pictures. Okay. Uh, but yeah, today I'm going to introduce Strawberry, which is the one I've been working on. Um, I used to contribute to Graphene, but then I decided to make something else though, just to scratch my own itch. Um, but before going deep into how Strawberry works, I'm just going to introduce a couple of features of Python 3 that we use in Strawberry. The first one is typings, and typings are a way for developers to give annotation to our code so you can kind of uh, document what the code is expecting and what the code is returning. So um, let's see an example. This is a class user where you have a constructor accept a name of type string and an age of type integer. Um, and then we have an evaluate user function that's accepting to user. And typings can be used for, uh, well, I should mention that I'm not going to use this. Um, this is valid Python code, but Python is not really caring about the types. This is just for like uh, readers of the code and maybe for some tools. Um, so they can be used for documentation. So you can understand easily what what a uh, what a, um, a function is expecting, what it's returning, and you can also run tools like MyPy to do static analysis of the code. So you can catch place where, for example, you're using the wrong types um, or maybe you misspelled something. And with modern ideas, you can also get auto completion, which is quite cool. It's quite useful. And more. As I mentioned, typings are not used at a runtime, but there are some libraries that make use of those uh, even at runtime. So, for example, there's a library called enforce that's going to enforce the type at runtime, which is quite useful in, in some cases. So, for example, if you're talking to a third party API, you can make sure that the data that you send is actually correct. But there's also another Python library that makes use of typings, and that library is called data classes which is built into Python 3.7. And this library simplifies the process of writing classes that act as data containers. So for example, our previous user class could be written like this. So a class user with two fields, one is name and one is age, accepting name is a string, age is an integer. And what data class is doing, um, it's basically kind of a bunch of mag magic methods for us. So it's creating the constructor, the representation method equals less than, greater than, and more. It can also become configured to, to change some of those uh, those methods. And this is really cool because um, we start using data classes that work quite a lot. Um, I think they help uh, us to think how you structure data on your backend. But also are quite useful when you talk, talk with third-party APIs. So, for example, instead of uh, us sending dictionaries around, we use data classes, so we document in all the parameters that we pass into to a third-party API. Um, yeah, but what about GraphQL? Um, Strawberry is using the same approach as data classes. If you think about it, uh, GraphQL types are data containers in a way, so we have a conference type, which is just a bunch of fields with types associated to it. It's nothing more than that. So in Strawberry, we use exactly the same approach as data classes. We have a decorator that's going to do a bunch of things on, on this class. Um, basically, Strawberry is going to generate the GraphQL types using typings. So it's going to fetch all the fields, going to see the types, and then it's going to create the GraphQL types that we can use for our API. But what about Resolver? So if you've seen this, it's cool. It's easy to use. But how can I fetch data for this? So we, we have a way to do so, and this is the one of the, uh, we actually have two ways, but this is the easiest one, where you can pass a strawberry field and you can pass the resolver. And when we, when you ask for that field on, on the API, that function is going to be called for you. So let's build a simple hello world. This is the simplest hello world you can do with strawberry. Just a bunch of lines that you have a proper GraphQL API that's running in the, um, that's running. So in this case, we have a query that has a only one field called hello, which is a type string, and it returns hello word. And this is also to show that you don't really have to write resolvers. There's always a default resolver attached to the fields, and it's going to return the current value of the field. Um, and then you can generate the schema using survey schema, and then this can be used with the debug server, and you have an API that's up and running for you. Um, but yeah, let's make this a bit more dynamic. So let's say that we um, want to return a random greeting instead of just hello world. First thing that we have to do, we have to create a function called resolve hello, where we, we have two parameters. Root is the, it's all the data that comes before the, this field. So in this case, it's going to be nothing because there is nothing above hello. 
and then info is just a bunch of information about the, the request. So, for example, it allows you to get the current user, headers, and so on. And then it's on a string, and then it's returning a random choice. Then we have to change the, the field to specify the resolver. And actually, I have a demo here. Okay. This is a bit more complex than what we showed. But yeah, we have a bunch of types. So we have a person. There's first name, last name, age, and then also has a field called full name. We have a company type, that's a name space. Uh, we have that database of people. Um, then we have a bunch of resolver for this one returns always the same person, this one returns a person by ID, and then we have a query where we define person, that's so gonna use the resolver person, and then we have person by ID. And we also have company. And we also have a mutation, but uh, Maybe I skip that for now. So to run this, we use the. I'm using pipamp, but it works with anything. So you do survey server, the schema file, and then you get an API that's up and running, and you can use. Okay, cool. So. It's a bit small. So this is a query I can do. So when I get the person and the first name, when I call it, it's going to return the first name. But if when I get, for example, the the age, I can do so. Um, if I get the full name, that works as well. And what I was mentioning before, that you can introspect the schema so you can see all the fields that you have here. So you don't have to, for example, if you giving this API to front end person, they don't really have to see the Python code to understand all the fields that you have. Can they can check the schema. But they can also check the documentation, uh, which is a bit easier. You can also filter things. And for example, we have a person here, you can add some description, then you can understand what all the information are in this thing. So let's see, maybe, so let's see the other one. So person by the, you can pass an ID and then this is gonna return that person. So it should be, okay. Yeah. Thing yeah, this is basically GraphQL in a nutshell. It's really, really cool and easy to use, uh, especially for front-end people. Which, to be honest, it's quite exciting because you don't have to deal with them asking you, oh, how can I fetch this information? Um, it's cool. Oh, yeah. Um, I think I deleted one slide. Anyway, um, we have some other bunch of features that I think make Strawberry a bit more interesting than other um, libraries. The first one, which is something I really like. It's called permission classes. And it's inspired by Django REST framework. Um, so you can pass a permission, a list of classes for permissions for a specific field. So you can make a field that's generic enough, but it also doesn't return information to the wrong people. So for example, you have a user type where the email is only returned if the current user is an admin. So you don't, you're not leaking, leaking data to someone else. We also support ASCII. ASCII is the asynchronous version of uh, Whiskey. Uh, so you can use Strawberry with tools, uh, with servers like Ubicorn or Starlet, and you can build the API and make it up and running quite quickly. We also support Django. Uh, we currently have a view that you can use, and you can import into Django and use to, to render the uh, graphical interface I showed before. Uh, but we're also working on a conversion of Django model to graphical type, so you can convert the model to a graphical type without having to define all the fields again, kind of like Django REST framework. Uh, yeah, but not everything is cool. Um, currently, Strawberry is quite unstable because we have been focusing on having an API that's really easy to use. Um, so we're trying to shift things and break it, at least for now, at least we get to like a stable release. We're also trying to experiment with, with cool features. And my next focus is going to be, apart from fixing a couple of bugs that I found recently, is to work on the new website and documentation. Because if you go to the website, there's just a bunch of text that's not really telling anything. Uh, and there is no documentation right now, which is something it, for a library is a bit annoying. Uh, but we are looking for a contributor. And this, this month is Oktoberfest. So if you if you send pull requests, you can get a t-shirt from uh, Oktoberfest. But you can also get a sticker from, from us. Uh, I have some stickers here if you want anyway, but yeah, if you send up requests, it's better. Um, but yeah, to be fair, it doesn't really matter if you use Strawberry or any of these other libraries. I really want to see people using GraphQL in Python because I think Python is 
definitely the best language for doing backend things. Um, so if we start improving this technology, we, I think it's quite amazing and it's quite useful. If we start using this technology more in Python, we're going to improve the ecosystem quite a lot. And um, people are taking pictures. Can I keep this line? But yeah, uh, what I was going to say, um, I think GraphQL improves the both the developer experience, especially on the clients, both on the back end, and it's also going to improve the uh, user experience for the user. So I think we should probably use this. Um, so if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. And thank you. Yeah, thanks very much for the talk. Uh, we have a lot of time for questions, so I'll run around and see if there's any. So here's the first. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks a lot for uh, GraphQL. I also a huge GraphQL fan and uh, very enjoying that it's, uh, it's right now uh, gathering in Python some attention. And my question is, uh, so n plus one, uh, do you somehow uh, try to fix uh, this issue with GraphQL? And do you um, have some plans? Uh, I don't think I'm going to have plans, at least for now, in, in Strawberry, um, because there are already some solutions that you can use. So uh, maybe it's easier if I go here. Um, so one solution is to use the info field to... Um, that this is going to hold the, the whole GraphQL request, so you can check uh, all the fields they're requesting. So it's easy to, for example, if you're using Django to do select related, so prefetch related. Uh, that's one way of doing it. There is another option that's called... Uh, um, data loaders, which I never tried to be honest. Uh, that would be another solution that you could try. Um, actually, funny enough, I had a blog post open here. I think it's probably here. Oh, uh, yeah. But yeah, uh, so I need to read about that. Um, but yeah, we don't really have plans for, for solving that, at least for now. Um, I know there are some, like for example, for Graphene, there is a Django optimizer. That's gonna inf uh, introspect the request. Um, this is something that maybe we can try and support as well, but not for now. All right. Yes. Yeah. Hi. Uh, could you tell us a bit more about performance and speed in comparison to standard REST API approach? Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. It really depends on what you're doing. So. Um, let's say that you have an API, that, like a GraphQL API that's quite optimized. So you're doing optimization also on the database level. So for example, let's say we have the um, conference endpoint, uh, sorry, conference field in GraphQL and you're only fetching the title. What you could do, uh, you can introspect the, uh, the request and you can also tell the database to just return that specific field. So that's making a bit it should make it faster because you're just returning less data. Um, but you can also add caching on top. I think one of the issues of GraphQL is that using post requests. So that makes it really hard to cache it because you cannot use tools like Varnish or, or you cannot really leverage client caching that easily. Uh, there are some solutions of that. Um, th some of them are a bit complex. Like, for example, there's a way it's called static queries. So you basically you comp you have a front end. You compile the queries to you fetch all the queries that you have, compile them to an ID, an hash, and then you send a GET request to your GraphQL API, and then the backend is gonna fetch the query associated with that ID that you're passing, and that allows you to just use GET requests, uh, which it's making faster as well. Um, I think with GraphQL you need to be a bit careful. But you always need to be careful, but I think it's easy to, to make uh, APIs that are quite slow because you can fetch everything you want. So, for example, if you have an API that's straight, straight converting from a Django models, for example, uh, you can fetch all the related fields and you can go really deep and that's going to make it slow. So, yeah, depends on use cases. There are some things you can do to, to prevent that. We can chat later if you want. Thanks very much. Uh Thanks. What does uh, using this with the async frameworks look like? Is it as simple as declaring the resolvers as being asynchronous? Yes. Um, that's a slide I deleted for some reason. Let's see if I have it. Oh, yeah, that was the one. <laughs> yeah, deleted by mistake. Yeah, you just put a sync in there and it works. Uh, to be honest, there is a bug in the select, uh, in the ASCII app, which I'm going to fix in the next couple of days, uh, which I think makes this not work. But when that's fixed, it's going to work. So you just use async things. Um, uh, I think an issue that I had, I was using, like here I'm using requests, but now there is ACPX. Um, which is an alternative request, and that doesn't work for some reason because it's creating an, its own loop 
I think I yellow, so I need to check if that's a bug or strawberry, or if it's a bug or HTPX. But yes, with request works fine. Uh, how how tight this thing depending on Django, and is it possible, or maybe you have plans to adjust it to Flask? Uh, oh yeah, that's I had the same question. So we don't really so. Something I should probably mention, GraphQL doesn't really depend on anything. So you can use it like with different databases. You can use with even REST APIs. So some of work, for example, we have a GraphQL layer that's talking with REST APIs. Um, but for having a view, like for example, Django one, um, we don't really have built in support for Flask at the moment. It's something we want to introduce, but you can use, there is a third party, uh, package called GraphQL Flask thing that you can pass the schema that you generate by, uh, yeah, by doing like this one, the scheme at the bottom. So you can pass that to the Flask uh, GraphQL app and it works. Okay, let's see if there are any more questions. Okay, if we don't have any more questions, let's thank Patrick again. Oh, is the question? No. There was one, one at the yes. front. Oh, sorry, I can't, I don't see. Oh, here you go. There you go. Um, hey, thanks a lot. I uh, was really excited to see GraphQL in production properly at some day. And regarding to that, do you know if there is any like strategies how you can gradually maybe introduce uh, GraphQL into existing project? Like if there is any anything that helps you like get started? Mm, yes, it depends what you have already. Um, so if you have REST APIs, something you could do, you can have a, an API gateway in front of the REST API. So you start, you have this gateway, then instead of... Um, like instead of being attached directly to the backend, it's gonna talk with the REST APIs. So when you build new things on the front end, you can start using uh, GraphQL for the new things, and you can reuse your uh, uh, REST APIs, which I think it's quite cool because you you get the benefit. You don't really get the benefits on the backend because you still have REST APIs, but on the front end, you get a lot of benefits because you can fetch the fields that you want. Uh, you can leverage uh, in the front end. There are some so many frameworks that are quite useful, and they do some caching and data fetching. We're quite smart. Um, there are some other people in JavaScript board, they do the GraphQL gateway on the front end as well, uh, which is a way of doing it, but I don't really like it. Okay, we have time for one or two more questions, if there are any. So, since we have any, since we don't have any more takers, let's thank you again for the talk.